I invite you now to turn with me to the book of Numbers, the sixth chapter, verses 22 through 27. We are continuing to move forward in our series, The Power of Good Words, as we examine some of the benedictions that are found throughout the Bible. Today we have what's known as the priestly benediction. Again, that's Numbers chapter 6, verses 22 through 27. The text reads accordingly. The Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Speak to Aaron and his sons, saying, Thus you shall bless the Israelites. You shall say to them, The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. So they shall put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. I want to talk just for a few moments from the subject, getting fitted for spiritual glasses. Getting fitted for spiritual glasses. The other day when some of the restrictions for the pandemic were lifted, I finally was able to go to my eye doctor to get an eye exam. And because I have a family history of blindness, I try to stay on top of my eye examinations with a routine uh, point of view. But I discovered in recent in my recent visit that it had been three years since I had last been to the eye doctor. And so after my examination, it was discovered that I needed a change in my prescription. And so I went through the routine of being fitted for glasses in which the doctor flipped the lenses which changed and altered my perspective. He asked me, which is clearer, A or B? Which is clearer, B or C? Which is clearer, A or C? The doctor was making an effort to clarify my vision, to make sure that it was focused sharply and keenly so that I could experience the fullness of God's creation. Well, beloved, it dawned on me in the chair at that moment that there are times in life when we need to have our vision clarified. Particularly in the times of crisis, it is so easy to lose focus. We can become distracted, we can become uh, narrowly visioned, or we can become so farsighted that we are unable to sharply and keenly assess our environment and our world. And distractions can be debilitating because they redirect energy and resources away from God's purposes and plans for our lives. Every now and then you need to be refitted for uh, your spiritual purpose and understand it with clarity and with conciseness. In fact, there are times when you got to change your lenses in order to get a more sharper focus. And what we find here in the text is Moses, the prophet that moves the people from Egypt to emancipation, serving as a spiritual optometrist, sharpening the communal focus of the people. For you see, beloved, it's been two years now that they've been wandering in the wilderness and they need a new focus. For the focus that they had as slaves in Egypt is no longer applicable to the focus that they need as a free people. 
Believe it or not, beloved, I just help somebody because when you get free from whatever binds you, you need to have your eyes retrained. You need to have a refocusing of your perspective so that you can live out the fullness of God's life. For vision as a slave is not the same as vision as a free person. And so when you get liberated, you need to have a sharper vision. The vision that you had as an addict is not the same that you need as somebody that's been in NA and AA meetings. The vision that you need as a person that's out of a bad relationship is not the same vision that you have when you're in a poor relationship. The vision that you have when you're functioning in God's right place for you is not the same vision that you have when you're outside of the will of God. When God liberates there then is the need to have a clarity of focus and a new understanding of one's purpose for existence. And that's what's taking place here in the text. Moses is laying down ground rules for a healthy communal life. And he lays down ground rules for the broader constituency of the community. And then he comes to Aaron and his family and gives them this clarified vision for their existence. The Lord speaks to Moses, so says the text. Tell Aaron and his sons this, saying, You shall bless the Israelites and the sermon that you shall preach, the benediction that you shall pronounce is this in total. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. That's the reason for existence. That's the reason for your life. That's the reason as a priest that you are to exist. That's what you are to engage your energies and all of your powers around blessing the Israelites. And so, beloved, as I ponder this text, I have to wonder what might we learn from the text how might our vision and reason for existence be clarified as a result of our engagement of this particular pericope? Well, the first thing that I see here is that if we're going to have a clearer purpose and a clearer understanding of that purpose, we must recognize that there has to be some generational continuity. Notice the text says, Moses tell Aaron and his sons. What I am about to do is begin the process of tradition. Tell the people they are blessed by God and that's your reason for existence. You see, beloved, we live in an age now that has a tendency to trash tradition and shred the things that have been handed down for us. But it is tradition that allows us to make meaning in life, particularly in times of crisis and periods of upheaval. We've got to learn that tradition is not necessarily a bad thing. And I need to just put you on blast today that there is indeed a difference between tradition and traditionalism. Traditionalism is tradition on steroids that's gone amok. Traditionalism is tradition that has become so inflexible and so uh, etched and ingrained in our practice that we really don't know why we do it in the first place. But tradition allows us to glean the resources of previous generations and helps us navigate the future. And beloved, uh, the words uh, and wisdom of Solomon are also true, that there is nothing really new under the sun. While we might think we are being so creative and so innovative, there's really nothing new under the sun. 
And I can hear some of you saying right now, but, but Reverend, there are things now that we have in the 21st century that we didn't have in the 20th century, that we didn't have in the 19th century, that we didn't have in the 18th century, nor in the world of the biblical text. And I'd say that you are right. There was no internet, but there was still means of communication. Yes, you may not have had a cell phone and you may not have been able to text, but you could write a letter and you could pick up that old black phone with the cord that would only allow you to go but so far in the house. Yes, you may not have had a fast car. You may have had a horse and buggy, but you still had means of transportation. There's really nothing new under the sun. For the real weighty matters of life have been handed down to us. Let me see if I can illustrate this for our purposes this morning. When I was growing up, my sister and I had a routine. It was a habit. It was not something we liked to do, but it was something that was imposed by my mother. Every Saturday morning, we had to do our chores, which entailed cleaning the house. We had the dust here, we had the vacuum here, we had the wipe here. And my sister and I, because we were both athletes, did not like cleaning the house on Saturday morning. But in order to make those moments of dread and maternal torture bearable, we always look forward to two things. For when I grew up in the area in which I grew up, we could always count uh, to accompany cleaning Soul Train and American Bandstand. I, I love Dick Clark and I love Don Cornelius who said love, peace, and soul. It, it, those made house cleaning bear, bearable. And invariably when we were cleaning the house and watching American Bandstand and Soul Train, one of the favorite portions for my sister and I were when we got to see the dancers, particularly on Soul Train, on the Soul Train line. And as people would dance to new music, my mother always had a stinging critique. While people were doing the latest dance, she would always say, that ain't nothing new. That's nothing but the mashed potato. And then she would do her version of the mashed potato. That ain't nothing but the Watusi. And then she would do her version of the Watusi. Beloved, believe it or not, the things that are handed down are already shaping us whether we realize it or not. And if we're going to have some spiritual focus and understanding for a time like this, we've got to then go and plumb the ancestors for their wisdom, for their strength, and for their vision. For the young have the strength to endure, but the old have the resources that have been matured under pressure and now can convey to us how to move forward in a time such as this. If we're going to have a clear focus, we've got to understand that there's got to be some generational continuity. Secondly, if we're going to be fitted for spiritual glasses, we've got to begin to get a sense of God consciousness. To use a phrase from Frederick Slaumacher, God consciousness. Here the blessing that is to be pronounced upon the people is filled with God consciousness. Here the blessing pronounced on the people. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. The Lord lift up his countenance and give you peace. If you're going to understand what you're supposed to be doing in a time of pandemic, you've got to recognize that it's not because of your own strength. It's not because of your own merit. It's not because of your own checkbook. It's not because of the degrees on your wall. It's not because you've got likes on your social media platforms, but it's simply because the Lord is keeping you. The Lord is blessing you. The Lord 
Lord is making his face to shine upon you and you can experience grace and the Lord will lift up his face and pay attention to you in a time such as this. I wonder do I have anybody that recognizes that the reason I'm able to make it in this time is not because of my goodness, ingenuity or craft, but it's because the Lord is my strength and my redeemer. The blessing reminds us that our human resources are meager in comparison to the challenges of our time. And though we must work and though we must protest and though we must witness, it is the Lord that undergirds and gives animation and energy to all that we do. So this blessing is filled with God consciousness, not political consciousness, not sociological awareness, and not even historical familiarity. But what gives us the charge and the boost that we need to endure is to come to a God consciousness that it is God who's keeping us, God who's loving us, God who is providing for us, God who is making ways out of no ways, God who keeps smiling upon us, God who keeps being gracious to us, God who keeps healing us. It's nobody but Jesus. And then lastly, beloved, if we're going to be fitted for spiritual lenses so that we can understand our purpose when we lose sight of our existence and its reason, we've got to practice generosity courage. It's here in the text. Notice in the 27th verse, it says, so they shall put my name on the Israelites and I will bless them. That's God talking, telling Moses that if the priests are faithful in blessing the people, then God in turn will bless them. We live in a time where there are so many people who are afraid to pronounce blessing on someone else because there is the fear that if I bless someone else, if I'm generous to someone else, then in some way I may lose something. And I'm not just talking about a mere generosity of the checkbook and of one's financial resources, but a generosity of spirit. It doesn't cost you anything to tell somebody thank you. It doesn't cost you anything to let someone know how much you appreciate them. It does not cost you anything to be gracious to somebody. It doesn't cost you a thing to be loving to another. It costs us nothing to be nice and kind. But our problem is we think that if we're kind, we're going to lose out on something and that the only way to make ourselves big people is to denigrate others. But when we can be gracious and kind in spirit to others, when we can share our resources with others, the text says that God promises us that if you bless another, then you got a blessing on your way. And I'm here to tell you that I've discovered that when I've been able to bless others, blessings have come back my way. Even at times when I had very little to bless folks with, I sacrificed it. And as soon as I sacrificed it, something came along my way before I could even miss what I sacrificed. I wonder do I have any witnesses here today that, that can say that I know the Lord is blessing me because I've dared to have the courage to bless somebody else. I've risked my own well-being. I've sacrificed my own resources. I've offered up what little bit I had to bless somebody else. And because I blessed another, I'm confident that God is going to bless me. It says if they put their names, God's name on the Israelites, that God would bless them. 
And so, beloved, when we lose our focus, there is this priestly blessing that helps us to refocus our vision for life. I started this sermon by telling you that I went to the eye doctor. And there the doctor examined my eyes and went through an exercise to sharpen my focus. But I didn't tell you that the eye doctor dilated my pupils. And because I have light sensitive eyes, every time I'm under dilation, I tear up. I'm not intending to cry, but I cried nonetheless. And when the doctor shines that bright light in my eyes so that he can see beyond the tears, he told me that my optic nerve was healthy. In other words, even though I was crying, I could see. Even though the tears were forming tributaries on my face, I could see and see well. Even though I needed some lenses to focus my eyes, my optic nerve was good and I could see clearly. Well, I want you to know, beloved, that there was another one who could see his purpose for existence. He had a 2020 focus in life. He came that we might have life and life abundantly. But the world through its fallenness gave him death. He came to usher in the kingdom of God, but the world in its brokenness gave him a crown of thorns. He came to set captives free and to pronounce the acceptable year of the Lord, but the world in its fallenness accused him of capital offenses. But because he had clear focus and knew what his mission was, his behavior changed the behavior of the world. For my Bible tells me that because he was obedient unto death on an old rugged cross, he's been given a name that's above every name. And because he knew what he was to be about, it transformed the behavior of the world. So that at the name of Jesus, every knee will bow. It won't be no necks anymore, but it will bow into submission to the eternal king. And every tongue shall confess. It won't spout the blatherings of white supremacist ideology. It won't shout the deconstructive criticisms of our age but every tongue will confess that he indeed is Lord I wonder do I have anybody that will just shout he is Lord and I'm glad he knew what he was to be about because he was about his business and took on an old rugged cross one Friday on a hill called Calvary. I now have life, I now have peace, I now have joy, I now have purpose because he was about his business. I can now be about my business, the business of living, the business of reconciling, the business of celebrating, the business of praise. Praise be to God that there is one in Jesus who had 2020 focus and because he had focus he's now the king of kings and lord of lords so bring forth the royal diadem and crown him i said crown him lord of and over all things that's something to celebrate he's lord of all things he's lord over the world he's lord over the country 
He's Lord over politicians. He's Lord over the virus. He's Lord over science. I'm glad that I've got somebody that has all power and is Lord over all. So crown him with many crowns. Praise him with your best praise. Thank him from the depths of your heart. Give him glory because he's king of kings and lord of lords. He was the one who served God our maker with any vacillation in a sense of purpose and with no disobedience in his behavior and because of the clarity of his focus not only did he bless us but he has become our blessing the blessing of God through Jesus Christ if there's somebody that needs to receive that blessing today, if you feel that you are without help, without any God consciousness, without any tradition to moor you and ground you, without any courage to be generous, then I encourage you to surrender your life to the Lord Jesus Christ. And in doing so, beloved, you will find a new reason for your existence. The old Egyptian mindset has to go so that the mindset of the encroaching promised land can begin to shape and mold our way of being in the world. As we invite you now to Christian discipleship, those are there may be those that would like to unite with the Mount Olive Church by letter from another Baptist church, by Christian experience, or because you've never professed a faith in Jesus Christ before as a candidate for baptism. There may be others that want to affiliate with the Mount Olive Church, though you may never step foot in the sanctuary of the Mount Olive Baptist Church in Arlington, but you want to join us on this journey and walk with us as we be and become all that God intends for us to be and become and to draw nearer to our Savior. We invite you to call in. The number is on the screen and there will be someone there for 30 minutes after this broadcast that will receive your call and help you with your decision. If there are those who are seeking prayer, you also may call the line and those will be tendered to us. And for those of you who have prayer requests, now is the time to send them in as we will pray for them momentarily. But if there is one that would acknowledge his or her need for the Lord, then we invite you to come as our singers sing and lead us into a deeper awareness of our need for God. Open wide. 